Wonderful. Okay, as we get started, just a, a gentle reminder that we do have a code of conduct and we're hoping for a nice, pleasant um, discussion here. So we will get that posted into the chat for everyone to see. Also, if you're going to be sharing anything on social media, please do. And we ask if you could use the hashtag CrossRef2023. Um, also, please put all of your questions in the Q&A box. That will help our team kind of manage the questions and make sure that they get answered and get seen. Uh, if you could do that versus the chat, that would be great. And yes, um, these slides and recordings will be shared afterwards. So thank you all for joining us. And I'll just hand over to, um, to Ed to uh, kick off with the strategy. Thanks. Great, thanks very much. Uh, thanks for joining everybody. Um, if you've been on uh, the previous sessions, you know we've already had some uh, great uh, discussions today. <clears throat> and so this session is the um, uh, annual meeting uh, session as, as we call it. So uh, we're gonna be doing a number of different uh, updates and uh, part of it will be an update on governance and the uh, board election and having the results of the, the board election. So this is really critical for a uh, association like Crossref. Uh, and this is how uh, a, a critical part of the, the governance and the community governance the, uh, that, that, that Crossref has. So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining. But um, if we go to the next slide, I'm just gonna give a little, uh, uh, overview first of uh, Crossref's uh, strategy and some uh, update on statistics. And um, just to remind people, the Crossref vision um, is uh, we are looking to uh, uh, create a rich and reusable open network of relationships, connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions, a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. This um, is another way of expressing the research nexus, which we heard about in the last session and uh, in some of the other earlier sessions today. And it involves uh, also working collaboratively with other organizations, uh, which we'll be talking about a, a little bit more. Next slide. So the mission uh, of Crossref, which is a little bit more uh, specific is uh, that we, uh, work to make research objects easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. Uh, and we do this as a nonprofit membership organization uh, that exists to make scholarly communications better. And as I mentioned, we're in the session now that's a critical part of us being a not-for-profit uh, membership uh, organization. So thank you very much to everybody who's who's uh, 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 voted uh, in, in, in this election, and we'll be having an update on that shortly. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our uh, research nexus uh, slide uh, and overview. And this has been touched on before today, but uh, just as a reminder, uh, this ties into uh, the vision that we have that I, that I just covered. Uh, but this more specifically uh, shows how uh, we want things to be able to uh, fit together through the whole uh, research life, life cycle from uh, creation uh, to posting, uh, and um, uh, funding use of the content. And you can see here in the middle uh, that this is where Crossref and some other organizations uh, that we that we collaborate and work with and other initiatives uh, such as ROAR, Datasite and, and ORCID all, all play an important role, but we wanna bring together and capture the scholarly record. We wanna have uh, relationships uh, between the key parts of the scholarly record. Um, and that can include even in Crossref's case, trying to expose more things publicly uh, about uh, about our process and uh, membership information, and um, uh, we've done that on our uh, on our website over the last year, and also uh, parties uh, assertions from other parties, and uh, the retraction watch uh, uh, arrangement with Crossref um, acquiring the retraction watch database and having an ongoing relationship with the. Center for Scientific Integrity to keep it updated uh, is, is an example of this, and that will be fed into uh, the Crossref API in the future, uh, but it'll be clearly, uh, the provenance of that will be clearly labeled as uh, coming from uh, Retraction Watch, and there's a whole plan, as you heard earlier, about the Relationships API to, uh, uh, to, to expand on that. Um, and I think uh, we sort of say 60% of this is, is possible. That's a rough estimate. Uh, the rest is aspirational, and so 
uh, we need to keep uh, working and uh, working together with the whole community to try to uh, get to this vision. Thanks, next. I did wanna just cover some stats. Uh, Ginny covered these in the session earlier today. Uh, the, fir the first session, which I know for some time zones was uh, very early, uh, but we pulled together statistics looking over the last uh, five years. Often we just do an update from, from the last year, but it was interesting to take a look to see how things have been growing. And uh, we can see here that uh, the total uh, uh, records registered with Crossref uh, has gone up 50%. Uh, so that's averages about 10% uh, each year, but it has uh, uh, the rate of growth has slowed down a little bit in the last couple of years. And, um, you know, we keep, keep an eye on these, keep an eye on these trends, but uh, overall it's, uh, it's still pretty impressive growth. And we uh, surpassed 150 million uh, records uh, uh, relatively recently. And if you see what we've highlighted here, you can see some of the fastest growing areas. You know, we still have the core of the journal articles, uh, books, conference proceedings. So in total numbers, those those are the most. Uh, but in we, if we look at what's grown the quickest over the last uh, five years, we have uh, uh, preprints, uh, peer review reports, and uh, grants, which is great that we basically had a few test grants uh, a few years ago. And Actually, this this might pick up uh, backfile grants as well. So they weren't necessarily registered five years ago, but uh, they, um, you know, that's that's grown, and we're getting close to hopefully be reaching a hundred thousand uh, pretty pretty soon. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and the next slide talking about the research nexus again and and relationships. Uh, this starts uh, this some of these stats capture some of those uh, relationships that we want to keep uh, building, and we have. Um, uh, preprints has uh, has grown, but the number of uh, preprint article links has grown, and uh, we're doing some work on matching in that area to to improve it uh, even even further. Um, and uh, a huge success has been the Orchid Auto Update. Uh, we've surpassed three million articles, granting us permission uh, to update their records, and uh, we've uh, pushed over sixteen million um, uh, publications into ORCID records. And so that's uh, something that happens automatically with the researcher's permission and uh, it saves uh, a lot of time. Uh, so that's been really good to see that that happen. Um, so uh, retractions uh, have grown, but it's still very small. Uh, we now can uh, supplement that with the retraction watch uh, data, but we also wanna keep trying to build that with, with publishers registering that uh, directly with Crossref and you can see that uh, references and open references has, has gone up, but particularly abstracts most recently have gone up a lot. And that's uh, I4OA, which is the initiative for open abstracts. Um, uh, we just had Wiley recently do over uh, a couple of million uh, uh, abstracts. So that's been really good, but that's some uh, community pressure. So it's not just coming from Crossref, but it's uh, a community uh, pressure and not just pressure, but highlighting the value. Of, of doing this and how that can be useful for uh, research assessment and research integrity as well. So we've seen uh, a lot of growth and, you know, it just shows the the scale of the, the infrastructure that, that Crossref uh, and the community have, have built. Uh, next slide, please. So taking a step back and looking at a higher level, <clears throat> Crossref has three key, uh, four, <laughs> I can count, uh, four key areas for uh, our strategy. We want to contribute to an environment uh, where the community identifies and co-creates solutions for broad benefit. Uh, we want us to be a sustainable source of complete open and global scholarly metadata and relationships. Uh, we wanna be publicly accountable to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, and that uh, covers sustainability, insurance and, and governance. And we wanna foster a strong team because infrastructure needs committed people who contribute to realize uh, the vision and thrive doing it. So I think fostering the, the strong team is really important. And just one really quick note is that uh, something that people don't talk a lot about with infrastructure is just some of the, the basics like bank accounts, for instance, we've uh, I've spent a, too much time over the last couple of weeks uh, uh, dealing with the bank accounts and Lucy and our finance team have also had to be doing with that. But some of those basics of infrastructure have to be have to get sorted out and uh, it takes people people to do that. So 
Next slide, please. We'll take a look in a little bit more detail about some of the things we're working on. And you can see this on the Crossref uh, website. I think the strategy page has been updated or is just about to be updated, but this is sort of the latest information. So we've re recently completed a number of key projects. Now these are across the different four areas, but if you look at the, the website, you can see them broken down into each, each uh, category. But uh, we have a, a new form for funders to register uh, grant records, so making it easier to get uh, metadata into the system. We also had a product update earlier um, about uh, uh, expanding that to, uh, to journals and other types of content. Of course, we acquired and opened the Retraction Watch database. That was a big, big achievement. And uh, very importantly, we reached our 12-month uh, contingency fund goal. So this is part of the uh, part of POSI. Uh, and so we have reserves of, uh, we have a, a 12 month uh, of expenses uh, reserve that, that, that we've achieved. Um, looking at uh, in focus, these things that we're working on, these are things, some of them are shorter term, some of them are gonna be continuing over the next year or so. Uh, moving from our data center to the cloud, we're sort of in between both. We have a number of things uh, running in the cloud already, uh, but we still have to rely on the data center and we uh, are looking for 2024 to be the key year that we make uh, some of those some of those big changes, uh, and also uh, we're just about to issue a uh, our POSI self assessment update, uh, and we're uh, undertaking a very important project to look at uh, resourcing Crossref and how our resourcing uh, supports sustainability and how we can achieve better equity in the Crossref fees, which have not uh, been updated. Or uh, they've been tweaked, but the basic fees have not changed and actually haven't increased for about uh, 15 years. So uh, that'll be something you'll be hearing about more uh, next year. So in uh, looking at things that are up next and under consideration, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, updating Crossmark and doing some community consultation, some really interesting stuff going on with uh, new participation reports. Uh, and uh, we are also looking at um, uh, you know, things a little farther out in how we, uh, you know, notify changes uh, to metadata. We're talking about a, a range of research integrity issues uh, and uh, we're in the process of um, uh, looking at uh, AI detection being added to uh, similarity check. And that's going to be happening very soon, but uh, we haven't had any kind of uh, testing or analysis of that. So a lot, uh, lot going on. Uh, a lot coming up. So uh, next slide, please. I did wanna just mention a couple of key areas that I think are really important. Uh, and I wanted to just mention ROAR again. Uh, you've heard about it today and we've been talking about ROAR for a long time. Uh, we help manage ROAR along with the California Digital Library and DataSight. Uh, it's been going along very well, but I did just wanna highlight it because we want uh, ROAR IDs to be used for affiliations and for all Crossref members to be uh, depositing that in their uh, Crossref metadata. So if you're not doing that uh, yet, uh, please uh, get started soon. Uh, next slide. And this is uh, just an example of, um, of, of a ROAR record. Uh, there's an API where you can see uh, the ID itself is, is very straightforward and it can be used uh, both for author affiliations and publications and, and Crossref records, but also uh, for, uh, for uh, funders. And uh, NWO, the, the Dutch Research Council, uh, is one of Crossref's uh, newest uh, funder members. And this is just an example of their record. There's also uh, sub uh, relationships, so institutes that are under that level. So there is a bit of hierarchy uh, in, in ROAR. Uh, next slide, please. So I did, I mentioned the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, Crossref is having uh, an updated um, uh, assessment of that, uh, but uh, so I won't uh, get into some of the details of this, but uh, sort of every year, every 18 months, we are updating uh, our, our uh, operations and policies against these, uh, these principles. Uh, and it's something that we're working on uh, collaboratively with other organizations who have also adopted 
uh, adopted the principles because this is really critical to uh, we think trust in uh, infrastructure. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the organizations uh, who have adopted the principles. And so we've been working with them uh, to uh, update uh, the principles as well. Sort of a, a, a 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 release rather than a 2.0 release. So we're looking at uh, helping to clarify the principles and update them. And we're hoping in the next couple of weeks, uh, there's gonna be uh, a revised version of the principles uh, that, we can, that we can issue. Uh, and then we'll be looking to get other organizations to to adopt them. And, um, you know, organizations find this really uh, useful uh, to, to evaluate their own uh, governance and policies and how they can how they can be in, uh, improved. So uh, keep a lookout both for uh, the revised uh, policies coming out, but also Crossref's uh, updated, uh, updated assessment. Next slide, please. Um, so the key areas that we've looked at over the last couple of years are uh, looking at our governance, broadening our board so it's more representative of uh, the different stakeholders uh, and uh, even looking beyond uh, member stakeholders. So uh, we'll be hearing about the, uh, the, election, uh, the election coming up. Um, sustainability, as I mentioned, we have, uh, now have a 12 month reserve fund uh, and we've posted more information on our website about operations and and just being transparent about our operations. Uh, we've got open APIs and metadata. We release a public metadata file every year and uh, references have, have been opened. Uh, we're trying to uh, work towards open source code. So new stuff uh, is open source. Our legacy code is not has not been open source because it wasn't done in a way to, to make that feasible, but we're working towards that over time. Uh, and uh, we're working with uh, a uh, number of other open infrastructure organizations, uh, and we'll have an update on that uh, a little bit later. So uh, next slide, please. And I did just wanna say, we mentioned how uh, people are, are critical to uh, the success of what we're doing. And I just wanna say a big thank you to the Crossref staff. Uh, a lot of work's gone into all the sessions today. So thank, thank you very much for that organization, particularly Rosa and Cora, but uh, everybody who's been speaking, uh, but just to note, uh, this wouldn't happen without the Crossref staff. So I just wanted to, to thank them. And here's a picture of us at our uh, all staff face-to-face, uh, -face, the first time we got together in uh, uh, since 2019. Uh, and that was back in uh, June uh, in, in Spain. And so that was, uh, that was great. And we are a fully remote organization. Uh, and uh, we have a couple of offices, which is uh, uh, just to hold over uh, from from past practice and as of uh, the end of November, we are uh, giving up the Oxford office uh, and uh, within a few months, we'll be giving up the US office. Uh, and so that will make us uh, a fully remote distributed organization. And uh, I believe that's uh, the end of uh, my bit. So I will hand over and uh, we'll hear a little bit about uh, partners and advocates. Thanks. Great, thank you, Ed. Um, yes, I will uh, continue um, from where you left here. Yeah, so uh, you can go the next uh, slide, please, or the next slide. Great, I want to start off by thanking our 51 ambassadors um, who come from that seven countries across the world. Um, our ambassadors work in a variety of roles, including publishers, editors, librarians, system engineers, and researchers, but they all share an enthusiasm and belief in our work, as well as commitment to work with others in the local community to help them to get to grips with all things Crossref. Next slide. We officially recognize the amazing work of our ambassadors um, they are doing on behalf of Crossref uh, across the world in their communities. The ambassador team has significantly improved the global representation of Crossref and improved our own knowledge of different communities. 
And our team has grown a lot this year um, with many new faces added to the group and lots of exciting achievement made. I'll just touch on a few uh, of the key highlights uh, this year. Next slide. And uh, just to introduce myself for this, uh, in this slide here, so um, Johansen Obanda, um, uh, Community Engagement Manager, and I joined Crossref uh, early this year and found um, our ambassadors already doing outreach, translation, uh, local and virtual events, and supporting the communities even directly. I had an incredible experience working with my colleagues and our ambassadors on a number of projects. Uh, we had a significant number of physical representation by our ambassadors in industry events, including in Brazil, Lithuania, uh, United Arab Emirates, India, and Tanzania. And uh, personal achievements among our ambassadors, including Zoe Tiana Dewey from Indonesia, celebrating her doctoral achievement with Crosser uh, team and ambassadors. Some of our ambassadors have also contributed to our global equitable membership program, holding introductory webinars in Nepal, Bangladesh, and Tanzania. We have had a recent blog contribution by Audrey from Cameroon um, and other training and community support by most of our ambassadors. Also for today's annual meeting, we acknowledge the contributions from our ambassadors, Vincas Grigas and Edilson de Masio, uh, who are speaking today in the community updates, and uh, Makiwe Shitindo and Randang, uh, who are panelists for the Research Nexus uh, panel discussion. We also want to acknowledge the valuable contributions of our community members involved in various advisory groups, interest groups, and committees. Uh, these groups help us maintain focus and, and, and ensure inclusivity. Our formal committees are either defined by our bylaws or established by the board with specific responsibilities. And we appreciate everyone's participation and input in our diverse community groups. Our advisory groups primarily seek input and guidance on establishing services and ongoing themes for members and stakeholders. And our interest groups serve as informal community discussion forums with broader scopes. Our committees, such as the executive and audit committees, are exclusively for board members, while the nominating and membership and fee committees are open to regular cross of members. And these committees ensure effective and representative governance, crucial for achieving our mission. We want to thank the nominating committee for making sure our board elections go well in the recent months. Uh, I believe it has been a busy season that will soon come to a full end. And if you're interested in contributing to these community groups, please reach out to Jeannie or Lucy for more information. The CrossF partners with other organizations, um, including ORCID, uh, DataSite, and PKP to provide coordinated services. Uh, Directory of Open Access Journals and CrossF, uh, DOH, uh, work together to enable content from journals indexed in DOH to be um, more easily identified through the use of cross uh, metadata. ORCID auto update, the other side enables uh, publications with cross of DOIs to be automatically added to ORCID author profiles. The cross of plugin for OJS enables OJS users to register DOIs with Crossref. And PKP can act as a membership um, representative for eligible users of open uh, journal systems who are not able to join cross directly due to financial, administrative, or technical barriers. And we're grateful that these um, synergies can help support our communities even better. The publishers learning and our community Place, uh, to the place to uh, the big one created for organizations interested in adopting uh, best practices in scholarly publishing. New scholarly publishers can access information from multiple agencies in one place, ask questions of the experts, and join conversations with each other. We work together with our Committee on Publication Ethics, COPE, the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ, and the Open Access uh, Scholarly Publishing Association, OSPO, uh, to keep the place going. And we acknowledge the collective efforts as partners in lowering barriers um, to participation and providing greater support 
for the organizations that publish scholarly and professional content. The community forum has attracted over 700,000 views this year, showing increased interest compared to last year. And this growth can be attributed to the active participation of our top uh, 10 contributors, many of whom are our, are our ambassadors. Um, they not only read messages on the forum, but also contribute their own insights. Consequently, the forum is not only monitored by our staff, but also by an expanding community that includes the ambassadors, uh, such as Edison, Bruno, and June this year as well, along with uh, various other stakeholders, such as cross up members, funders, metadata users, sponsors, service partners, and researchers. Uh, furthermore, for those uh, seeking practical illustrations or information on content registration, uh, the community forum offers a valuable series uh, um, called Ticket of the Month, where our support team selects and presents uh, real examples, often featuring complex challenges that require collective problems. And these posts are accessible via uh, the link on the slide. And we encourage you to explore the series. You might even find yourself among the prominent contributors next year or your question answered by a dedicated member. Thank you very much. And I will now hand over to Lucy. Thank you. Um, I'm Lucy Ofeish. I'm the Director of Finance and Operations here at Crossref. Um, we're gonna do some member governance work today and um, talk through our board election, get to our final results. Uh, and I'm joined by Emily Cook, who is our external legal counsel from Pierce Atwood. Um, <clears throat> so just remind you of our code of conduct and um, the places you can find the ongoing discussion from the meeting on social media, uh, you can follow that hashtag. So to start us off, um, before we get into some of the governance pieces, uh, this meeting is our chance to give our membership community um, kind of an overview of where Crossref stands. Each year, our annual meeting is an important kind of check-in point for our members to um, look under the hood of the organization and, and have a chance to ask questions or weigh in on business matters as it relates to the association. Um, so I wanted to give you a look at our last five years of financial performance and how things are going as we head towards the end of this year. Um, we, sh we are forecasting to end the year about $12 million in revenue um, and a, just shy of $11 million in expenses. Um, that's up a bit from, on both cases from previous years. Um, I know Ginny recapped a bunch of stats earlier today, but if you didn't get to that first session, there's some trends you can notice here. Memberships continuing to grow. Membership numbers are growing at a higher rate than membership revenue um, because we're seeing growth in our sponsored membership and in our GEM program. Um, content registration is continuing to pick up. It uh, Content registration, it follows the trend that you're all probably experiencing at each of your organizations. Our content registration reflects the volume of content that gets published and put out there and shared and then registered with us. So um, we're seeing a tick up this year, up 7% from the previous year. That's up again from the previous year when we were seeing about 2% growth. So we tend to kind of see um, a ping pong of growth, but this year we're seeing an uptick. Um, on the expense side of things, we're still seeing expenses rebounding from COVID. We're seeing the effects of inflation um, on all, almost all of our expenses, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, and we're seeing things like um, big increases in our hosting costs related to our migration to AWS. I believe Ginny also mentioned that this morning, but that's up 
substantial. You can see here on non-personnel lines, that's where that big jump in AWS fees are. Um, we're resuming travel and things that we kind of, as we were going through pre-COVID, we had these numbers, then they actually started to dip down during the COVID years and we're kind of crawling back out. So um, we're keeping an eye on that, but overall the organization is financially very healthy. Um, as Ed mentioned, we just recently hit our 12 months operating reserve goal. Um, so financially, the organization is very stable. Um, in November, the board looks at our 2024 budget. So once that's approved by the board, we'll post it on our website. Our um, year-end tax filings are all available on the sustainability page of our website. If you ever want to look at our um, financials um, or just get in touch if you have any questions. Uh, so we wanted to talk through some governance stuff, give the overview of how our governance is structured, brief overview. I won't make you do a whole deep dive on tax code. And then we'll get into the election and the results from the election that closed um, just about in 90 minutes ago. Um, so Crossref is a 501c6 organization, which means we're a trade association, which means we are governed by our members one of the reasons why we're together today. Um, our board is comprised of members membership organizations. Directors that are elected to our board are representatives of the member organization. The board seat itself belongs to the organization, not to the individual. Um, we elect board members to serve three-year terms and they can then stand for re-election if they go through the nominating process. Um, we have officer positions that are elected by the board to serve one-year terms, um, and board members comply with, um, New York state law related to whistleblower policies, conflict of interest disclosure, um, antitrust compliance, any number of, of board obligations. Um, so the role of the board at Crossref is to provide strategic and financial oversight of the organization, as well as guidance to the executive director and the staff leadership team. Um, we do that in a number of ways. Uh, the board sets the strategic direction for the organization. Um, they, they look at financial performance, um, forecasted performance, uh, provide oversight into our investment management um, and other kind of financial obligations. And then the board weighs in on new policies, kind of at a policy level, and then services in their implementation. Uh, the board meets three times a year, which is where a lot of this work happens. And then there are a number of board committees, which Obanda mentioned earlier, um, which specialize in specific areas of board responsibility. And work happens at that level as well. Some of those committees um, are uh, partially board members and partially member organizations. We're always looking for uh, committee participants. So if you're interested in this nominating process that we'll talk about in a moment or um, other committee work, just get in touch with me. I'll put up my email um, at the end. Uh, and yeah, it's just a great way to get involved and kind of help steer the direction of the organization. Um, so we'll get into the annual meeting election. Um, the board election is primarily, uh, conducted online. We use a third party company called eBallot. Uh, they, so as we get into this, we're going to do two calls for motions. This is where we get audience participation. Um, Rosa, if, so when we call for a motion, you can raise your hand. Any member, anyone who's representing a member organization, you don't need to be a board member, you can be a board member, um, can raise a motion. We're gonna ask you to move to um, accept the slate for nomination. And then eventually as we get towards the end of the session, we'll ask to move to adjourn the formal portion of the annual meeting. Um, so get your Zoom hands ready. Um, so, Let's walk through 
the election procedures. The notice of the annual meeting was sent to all voting contacts on September 27th. It was sent to anyone who is a member of record as of September 10th. Um, we had 18,083 members eligible as of September 10th to vote in the election. Um, each voting contact for those 18,000 members received a ballot from eBallot with unique credentials um, to submit their vote. Our quorum is a minimum number of 100 members. We have we have 1,438 members represented by proxy today, as well as all of you who are here on Zoom. Um, so we can conduct business because we've met our quorum. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Emily to uh, walk us through the structure. Hi everybody, as Lucy mentioned, thanks Lucy. I'm Emily Cook. I'm a lawyer and I serve as outside counsel to Crossref. Um, as Lucy mentioned, the board is comprised of 16, uh, 16 board members, um, and each serves a three-year term. Each year, approximately one-third of the board seats are up for election, and so this year, there are seven seats to be filled on the board, um, and Crossref's bylaws provide that the board is structured to maintain a rough balance between member tiers based on revenue size. As Obanda and Lucy mentioned, the nominees are chosen by Crossref's nominating committee, a group of represent representatives from five Crossref member orgs, three of whom currently serve on the board and two who do not, and none of whom come from member organizations that, that have a candidate on the year's slate. The purpose of the nomcom is to review and create the slate each year for nominations on, to the board, seeking fair representation of membership. This year's committee are those listed on the screen and we very much thank them for serving. Okay, so our nomination process, um, the committee convenes, they take a look at the current composition of the board, the seats that are up um, and what those seats kind of represent in terms of the distribution of board experience geography, any number of factors. Um, and we then issue a call for public expressions of interest. This is posted on our blog each year um, around April, May timeframe. Um, we received 87 responses to seven seats. Uh, so the committee then kind of digs in and does the work of going through every response. Um, we'd settle on a scoring rubric. We go from the big list to the medium list, to the short list, to the very short list, um, over a number of meetings. And this, uh, committee really put in the time, um, with each response. And, um, it was a very competitive year. Uh, we had, um, I think the, maybe the most responses we've had, uh, certainly in my tenure and, uh, we put together a really great slate and there were many compelling candidates that we couldn't advance. So if you did apply and want to apply again next year, if you haven't applied and are interested, stay tuned for the call. It's posted on our blog um, in April, May timeframe. Um, and yeah, we'd love to hear from more folks next year. But I did just want to take a second to thank the committee for spending time um, going through that going through all the candidates. Um, okay, Emily, you're just gonna walk us through yes. our slate and then we'll get sure. into our motions. So the NOMCOM's recommended slate of 11 candidates for this year's seven open board seats is as shown in the smaller organization tier for five available seats, Bailstein Institute, Wendy Patterson, Korean Council of Science Editors, Ki Hong Kim, Lou Josh Ventures Limited, Olu Joshua, NISC Limited, Mike Schramm, Open Edition, Marin Dacos, Universidad Autónoma de Chile, Dr. Ivan Suazo, and Vilnius University, Vincis Grigas. In the larger organization tier for two available seats, Association for Computing Machinery, Scott Delman, 
Oxford University Press, James Philpotts, Public Library of Science, Dan Shanahan, and University of Chicago Press, Ashley Town. And we thank each of those candidates for putting themselves up for, for election. Will someone make a motion, as Lucy described earlier, to formally place these names in nomination? And Rosa or Ginny, if you if you can see when we have a hand raised, let, let us know. Uh, I have it here, just a moment. Uh, Wendy Shuck, I will uh, put on your uh, microphone. If you could just also please um, introduce yourself in addition to your comment. Hi, I'm Wendy Shook. I'm a scholarly communications librarian at Brandeis. Thanks, Wendy. Is there a second? Yes, there is. Just a moment. Uh, the same, same thing. Please introduce yourself before your response. Hi, Mark Gillespie, React Dome, seconding. Thank you, Mark. We'll share the results. The election was held, as Lucy mentioned, using a third party platform, closed today at 1300 UTC and the results were available to us in, in real time. Uh, and I'll let Lucy do the pleasure of announcing. Thank you. Um, and this is our incoming class of 2024. Um, tier one seats go to Wendy Patterson, Keon Kim, Marin Dacos, Ivan Suazo, Vincis Gracus, sorry. And um, the tier two seats go to James Philpotts and Ashley Town. Um, these folks are now formally elected to serve as directors of Crossrap, and they will assume their seats um, at the March 2024 board meeting. Okay, so if we don't have any other board business, well, let me rephrase that. Do we have any other board business that members wanna raise? You can just raise your hand and Rosa can call on you. Just a moment. I do have one raised hand here, but I'm not sure if that's from the last call, but I'll unmute, it's uh, Wendy. Sorry, I didn't lower my hand. <laughs> um, if we don't have any board business, we can move to adjourn this portion of the meeting. Okay, let's, um, so could I have a motion? Mm -hmm. need any brave hand raising to move to adjourn. Oh, okay, hey, just a moment. I have someone here. Thank you, Mark. Yep, Mark Gillespie, move to adjourn. Thank you. Uh, can we have a second? Okay, just a moment. Uh, Wendy Shook, second. Great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we um, are adjourned for the formal part of the annual meeting. Um, and I think Rosa, you're gonna close us out. I am. So um, thank you all very much for, for joining us today. Um, next session, we are going to have um, the community initiatives and um, highlights. We're hoping that you will join us for that. We will add the links into the chat here. On the event page, if you're having difficulty joining a, se a session, go to in, in Shed, go to the bottom of that page and contact uh, event organizer and um, I will get your email and I'll be happy to sort you out. Congratulations to the new board, board members. And um, yes, we hope to see you on the next call. So thank you all and uh, be well. Thanks, Rosa.
Bye-bye. Bye, all.